shall we move on to our game review? Yeah. Game review. Please send me a song for this little part. Yeah. Our game of the week is Coimbra. I actually, it's more fun to say Coimbra. It's catching on. It's better. Coimbra. This is a game that came out in 2018. It plays two to four players. The box tells you 60 to 90 minutes. I'd say it, 90 would be your minimum probably. Uh, two hours, I think, is totally safe. Board games are famous for lying about their playtime. They always lie, yeah. Um, Flaminia Brazzini and Virginio Gigli. Uh, definitely saying those incorrectly, and I apologize for that. Those are the designers of uh, Coimbra. They also designed my favorite game of 2016, Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Uh, and they are a part of the sort of Italian elite of medium weight board game designers. Uh, Gili also did Grand Austria Hotel with Simone Luciani. Simone Luciani, who's probably my favorite Italian designer, who did Zolkin, Marco Polo, and Lorenzo. Um, do Italian designers j- just make the best medium weight Euros? And why? <laughs> what is happening in Italy? That allows these individuals to make just the best medium weight euros of the last, I don't know, 10 years. I think it's a, it's a good question. It's not one I am prepared to answer. No, but I, I think I, we, we can certainly look at these games and say they're amazing. Yeah. And I mean, Zolkin, Marco Polo, Lorenzo, and now Coimbra are all those are all super fan, great games. Fantastic super games. Great. I'm always happy to play. And as you know me, that there's plenty of games that I'm not happy to yeah. play. And those are always on the list. And I think I think th- there must be just this little pod of gamers there that are feeding off of each other and working together and I mean they, they all seem to work on each other's games. So uh there is some sort of overlap happening. And you'll always find at least one of these guys on a list of, you know, a new uh, Italian medium weight euro. Um they seem to sort of swap back and forth. They don't they, it's not like they have it's not like one of them always works with one of them. They seem to always be switching around. If you like you know, you look at one of them and you'll see, oh, he designed it with this, that guy designed this with him, da da da. But those names, Flaminia Brazzini, Virginio Gili, and Simone Luciani seem to be on almost all of them at some point. Yeah, I feel like a theme is emerging here of of like the board game industry starting to kind of mirror what took place in film theory yeah like this is the italian (laughs) neorealists and then there's the french new wave happening over here but you do see that like there's a there's a culture there where they're they're feeding off of each other they're doing really good things they're collaborating with each other and we see that in film all the time um you know you get a scene recently like suddenly you know Direct uh, Mexican directors, yeah, were, of course, you know, huge, yeah. Now and that's kind of like, how does that happen? And, and there's like a certain critical mass that happens, mm-hmm. maybe because they all come from a certain school, yeah. they're friends, similar film school, they, fil- they feed off of each towns. other rather than working in isolation. And some really great stuff happens, and I think that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. So Coimbra is the latest from the uh, the Italian neo realist board game <laughs> world, uh, and it is a dice placement. I think is what we'd say instead of worker placement. This is it is a worker placement mechanic, but instead of workers, you are placing dice on the board in order to take actions. Let's do a brief rules dive here, just so people understand the basics of the game. So the first thing that you're going to do is you are going to have a slight asymmetrical start. There are this is a card based game, much like Lorenzo is, where there is a deck of cards that are all going to come out in a certain order. Uh, the order of uh, the cards are going to come out depending on the age is going to be slightly different. There's level ones, level twos, level threes, but within those, it's all shuffled up. You will see every card every game, but you don't necessarily know when the card is going to come out. So the uh, age one or level one cards are all put into pairs, and then people asymmetrically, well, uh, in reverse turn order, select them. And those sort of give you your starting powers. Usually, sometimes they'll give you a little bit of extra starting goods. Sometimes they're going to give you little ongoing powers. And uh, everybody starts with seven money and seven military. There are two incomes and two resources in this game. And all cards are either purchased with money or with military power. Let's start with like the theme of the game. Sure. Like what's the narrative? Oh, there's a theme in the game. There is. Oh, okay. What's the theme in this game? Okay. So if I understand it correctly, uh, Coimbra is a... Portuguese city. Yes. We are in the age of discovery. Mm. And each of us is playing a house, like a great house. Right. So maybe the Italian, like Medici mm-hmm. kind of thinking at operation here. So we're each playing a great house and we are essentially like re- recruiting the city's most 
famous, powerful citizens to our side. So right. part right. of card the mechanics of the game mostly involve getting these citizen cards that are of four different types and adding them to our tableau, mm -hmm. which are then giving us powers. Right. And um, Sometimes endgame scoring, sometimes in-game powers, sometimes just one-shot resource injections. Right. I, the, we will start on a level playing field, and then as the game progresses, each of our positions will start to vary in terms of what we're good at yep. based upon the citizens that we have recruited, which is directly affecting essentially what are like four different tech trees right. that are giving us certain powers yes. when we take an action. And those tech trees are, are the main knobs of the game that you are turning in order to sort of decide what you are good at and what your path of victory is. And this is something that you that board gamers, experienced board gamers will be somewhat familiar with from uh, games like Zulkin or... or Terra Mystica, Mystica, or now Gaia Project. Right. A, a lot of ones track, you know, a tech, some kind of tech tree mm -hmm. or a cult track or something like that where you've devoted resources and now you're better at a certain thing as you progress up that track. And there's and, usually some form of an area majority fight for that track as well. Whoever right. it's Both giving you powers and then you'll score it at exactly. the end, end of the game. Um, so to me, the cool mechanic in this game is that it uses dice in two different ways for the, for the pips on the dice and for the color of the dice. So there are, I think four different colors and well, yeah, one for each of the tracks, four different colors. And then one white die, which is a wild die. You roll all those dice and then you draft them one at a time. So people select dice and then you place dice in, in there are four different sort of worker placement spots in the game. And at first you are only Drafting, where you place them, the number is what's relevant. Later on, the color is what's relevant. Later and on in the turn. Yeah. Later on in the turn. And that is a really cool idea to me is that at first all I care about is the number, but I need to think about later on that color is going to be really relevant of what color die I take. So uh, there are... Oh, I'm going to make a correction. Later, oh, yeah, sure. later on in the round? Later on in the round. Right, if we're making this, especially if it's You're our right. podcast thing, uh, round would be... The Multiple turns. There's four rounds in the game, right? Yes. And then each of us is taking turns... Yes. During the round. Correct. So you're right. Later in that round, the color will matter. So at first, there are four different places you can put your dice. In the top, you can get some quick little uh, little bonuses. Sometimes it's a little resource injection that you need in order to buy what you're going to buy later. And the top one is, uh, is a little bit of a rule break there. They are going to be resolved from lowest to highest. And normally, the higher the die is going to decide how soon you get to choose your cards. So if you put a six in of the four cards you can choose from per lane. So think of four lanes... And three of the lanes have four cards in each one. And if you put one of your dice in a, in, in a specific lane, you will be picking one of the four cards in that lane. And the higher your die, the earlier in turn order you get to pick. So if you put a six down, your first choice. Uh, if somebody else puts a six down, if they put it down later than you, their second choice. Somebody puts a number lower and on and on. Yeah, this is a, kind of like a surprisingly difficult concept to explain without seeing the board yeah. yes the idea is we're gonna have like three different tiers of four cards each mm -hmm. and within each of those tiers we are auctioning yeah it's basically the, an the, auction the four citizens yeah and we're gonna want you know based upon what our strategy is i might i might look at this group of four cards and say i'm really interested in one of these cards i'm kind of interested in a second card and i'm not at all interested in the third yeah. and fourth and based upon if i put a die in that section you know, the amount of pips I put on there is my order. It's going to determine the order in which I can auction. And it's also going to determine what you pay for that pay. card. So if awesome I place decision. a six there, I'm saying I want first choice and I'm willing to pay six the maximum. Right. And each card either has a military symbol or a money symbol on it. And that decides what you must pay for it. So if it's a military symbol, that means, you know, thematically, yeah, those are the two you, you can only be swayed by how much military power you have. And the other person will only be swayed by money. But the how much you're spending, whether it's military or money, is completely dependent on the pip on the die. So if, if you see a card and you go, basically, you want to drop a six if you see a card that is, I need that card for my strategy or else I'm in trouble. Uh, Anything less than that, you're, you're, you're basically saying, I can live without that card. Yeah. So I think um, we're not here to explain the entire game. Yeah. But what's cool, I think, about this um, game is the way that they're using the dice in multiple ways. Um, in the same way that we see, like, the Carl Chuddock games, the, the um, innovation, innovation, innovation glory, glory, to Rome. glory to Rome, that are trying to use cards in, you know, three or four yeah. different ways that you can use a card here you're seeing dice being repurposed to a number of different me mechanics right that's a great analogy yeah um and it's also using 
dice in a way that I think is more appropriate to like the board game world, or at least the Euro, the serious Euro world, where yeah. um, we're rolling the dice mm-hmm. first. Yeah. That's key part. Yes. Roll, roll, the, roll the dice. We all see the situation. Right. And now we are making decisions based upon you know, the world that has been created right. for us by the die rolls. In turn order, everybody takes one die. Yeah, that's that's what you're doing during this part of the game. And then we're finding is like, b- b- I'm choosing these dice not just because of the pips mm-hmm. to determine, you know, how I'm going to use this die in these multiple auctions we're about to do, but the color of the die right. is also going to determine the nature of the action that I'm going to take in the second half of the round. Right. So after you use the pips on the die in order to auction and buy cards, you are then going to take those dice back. And when it is your turn again, you're going to toss that die away and take the action based on the color of the die. And the color of the die corresponds to one of the four tracks in the game. So let's say you're on the orange track, which is the money track, and you are halfway up it. You will see next to where your little circle is, where you are on that track, a certain amount of money. For every orange die that you throw away, you get that much money. And each track has a different thing. It's money, military, movement on the uh, map, which we'll talk about, and then victory points. So each die will get you one of those things. So those dice are usually your only way to get money or military, which are the main resources you'll need for next round the main to way, keep yep. it going. Yeah. So right, right. Um, orange and gray are your get resources dice, mm-hmm. and then green and purple are your kind of spend resources. Yes. I mean, exactly. I, purples well, move. Purples, purples get specific things that are based. So let's talk about the map. Yeah, but quick. when you have the resources, that's what you actually use to buy your cards. Right, in but the next round, yeah. Those are kind of your engine things are coins and guards. Yeah. And, uh, and I would say one of the insights of the game is that you don't want to try to do both of these. You, yeah, you, you actually really have ca- to pick one. You want to specialize. Yeah, you're either, you're either strong in money or strong in military. Trying to do both is... is yeah. Is a classic blender. And so, and then the last one, the green one is points, which I have tried many times as of other players to see if you can really have a green only strategy. And we have found you cannot. Well, we'll get into strategy later. I don't think that's been proven. No, I, I, I have not seen it done. I've not seen a green only strategy work where you're really just pushing the in game points as opposed to the end game points. That could just be a, a, a player deficiency problem in skill level on my part. Uh, I just I don't think we have enough reps yet, and I also think that yes, like the green dice early in the game are should be devalued. Yeah, and then if you didn't put the work in to pump the green track up right. at the end of the game, they can be worth a, a ton. But okay. you had to have done the work, and the question is, is that a viable strategy compared to map strategy? Right. And at least in our group right now, map strategy seems to be dominant. Seems to be very strong. So there is a map in the game, and. Uh, on that map, each one of you are going to have a little meeple character, a little guy, and you're going to start off on different sections of the map, and you're going to all sort of spread out to different areas. And on the map, there are going to be randomly put out tokens. On each of these tokens are going to be some reward you get by achieving by getting to that place on the map. When you get to that place on the map, you drop one of your little circles on it to show that you've been there. It doesn't block other people. Everyone can go everywhere, but you are all going to be starting out spreading in different directions. So if you if you end up wanting to go where somebody else went, it's going to take you a little work to get there because you start po- sort of pointing. Everybody starts pointing in a different direction, northeast, southeast, you know, like that. Um, there are, on the very outskirts of the map, there are level threes, which are going to be big endgame scorers that you're going to want to you build your, your game around getting to them at the end because when you get there, you get the points instantly, and they're usually going to be things that reward you know, if you have the most purple cards, you'll get two points for every purple card you've collected throughout the game. So you wouldn't want to rush there. You want to hit it at the very end of the game and get as many points as you can. Um, and and, and you know, a lot of those early little map spots are going to be resources that you need to help you sort of, you know, get your, your engine, yes. get, get your engine going early. Yeah, exactly. So I, I really like this game. And I think the reason we chose this game was because it uses dice. Yeah. And it's, in, and it's a tray approved Tray approved dice. Use use of of dice because I have generally very strong feelings about dice. There's a lot of games I won't play, or I think that you know the use of dice in the game is inappropriate. And this is a good one. This kind of falls into the same category as uh, Troyes or Twa. 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 Um, so let's talk a little bit about why I think that this is a good use. Yeah. Why does why does the why do the dice in Coimbra not offend you? All right. So. I'm going to introduce a little concept here. It's, 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 this is not anything new to me. This is um, kind of standard stuff in, in board game design circles. But let's talk about input randomness versus output randomness. Okay. So here's, here's the concept. 
Output randomness is one that we're really um, familiar with from having played games like Dungeons and Dragons or something else where um, you're going to say, I want to do a thing, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to roll a die and see if I succeed. Got it. Okay, that's output randomness. Uh, it's I think gambling like, a little bit. I, I, need, I need to hit something. I'm going to see if I hit it. Well, I think with gambling, you'd even say, I have a choice about whether I want to do it or not. Right. Whereas, like, in Dungeons & Dragons, it's like, I'm, we're going to fight. Yeah. I have to roll the hit. Or you, you fell into a pit. Do you survive it? Like, do you, do you, do you jump over it? Fell into it. Okay. I guess, so here's the actual, like, I, I got a technical definition. Okay, here. please. Yeah. This is the noise injected between the player's decision and the outcome. And noise, here we should use as a term to mean, like, randomness or... Um, the thing that makes that puts uncertainty mm -hmm. and there's like there's plenty of noise in games a lot of times it isn't like i'm rolling a die it's just like i just don't know the situation here i don't know what you're gonna do i don't know how the cards are gonna flip right. i don't know how the dice but that's that could be um that's what we would call noise so i want to do a thing did i succeed that's output randomness input randomness is you know whatever the element of luck or chance is uh happens generally first and yep. then it informs the player before they make a decision. Okay. And so this is exactly what we're talking about with games like Coimbra or Twa, where we have a bunch of dice, we roll a bunch of dice, everybody sees it, we have this like playing field that we then all can react to. Right. And, and that's where you, the, what are you gonna do the richness of our decisions is the randomness, and, and it's, it goes to replayability too, yep. of you know how do you react to these dice. But it's not a case of like, I want to do a thing. Do I succeed? Roll, roll, roll. Right. Yay. And or roll, roll, roll. Uh, you know, like yeah. that's, that's output randomness. And the input one get, has an interesting uh, sort of player experience because often we'll all roll those dice and as a group we'll all go, oh, this is going to be some round. Like, oh, this is going to be a pretty intense round. This, oh, man, this is going to be a cheap round. Like, whoa, guys, like for people who've spent a lot of time collecting resources, like that did not pay off for you because everybody's going to be able to get anything. And then you get rounded lots of sixes and everybody goes like, but see, but that's uh, an example I'm where poor. the dice rolling in this game does have a little bit of output randomness to it. I think right. in that, like say for example, in this game you have, um, and as it has happened in our game last night, I went really heavy on resource acquisition yeah. early on. Like I had a really good uh, guard. You were never poor engine. It was pretty exclusively guards, yeah. but um, you know, I was maxing that out where I was going into rounds with twenty to spend. And right. so in that case, like I actually want to see high dice. Yeah. Like when we roll the dice from the next round, right. I want to see high dice so that I can go in and buy the cards I want because I have more resources. So you can get two expensive cards where everybody else can only get one. R right. So if if we had in a sense rolled the dice there and it had been a really low distribution, yeah. that would have been an example kind of of output randomness of affecting me here mm -hmm. because I was saying I, I, I want, you know, certain things are going to benefit me here. And then the dice, you know, didn't go away. I would like, right. So a little bit, but usually when you're rolling a pool of, I think it's 17 dice in this game, you're usually going to, there's usually going to be some sort of median, right? I mean, that's, yeah. The, the extremes I, are I more think rare. You're starting to fall into the classic blunder of expecting dice to even out. Right. Like that's, that's a lot of times what designers do is they'll use output randomness. And when people like me object to it, they'll say, well, it'll even out. In the right, end. right. There'll right. be enough die rolls that it'll even out. And that's just not true. Right. Uh, or it, it, it doesn't have to be true at all. Sometimes it evens out. Sometimes it doesn't. And you'll get someone like Stefan, just... Stefan Feld, who often will just say, you, you can see in his design, he does not believe they'll even out. So he gives you lots of levers for affecting the dice. You know, you spend workers to raise or lower and, you know, there's, you can always, you can always, if you're willing to pay the cost, make it whatever you need it to be. Yeah. That's like some form of compensation. I think like acknowledging the weakness that's right. in, in, in going that route. Now, the thing is, is like, I think output randomness can be great. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a question of it should be in the kind of game where you want output randomness. I think it's totally appropriate for Dungeons and Dragons. I think it's totally appropriate for Warhammer. Yeah. I think it's totally appropriate for a light game or a short game. Uh, I mean, Las Vegas is kind of built on this almost where, you know, like you, you want that emotional thing of like roll, 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 yay, right. crit right. or fumble. Like yeah. these are all, you know, really can be very emotional exciting uh experiences it's just a question of 
what's the right match there? I don't want that in the game I've played for three hours yeah. for it to come down to a single die roll right. um, where I'm playing High Frontier, you know, Ooh. brilliant. Phil Eklund, yeah. Phil Eklund, you know, solar system exploring game, and my game is all going to come down to I'm trying to land on this right. asteroid, yeah, and I'm going to succeed on a one through four, and on a five or six, my game is over. Right. The designer, I, in that sense, I think would tell you those were the odds, <laughs> and, but that's been and, and it may be the, that may actually be more factual and accurate to your actual chances of surviving something like that. But that does not necessarily make for a great play experience. That's right. Yeah. It's like you, yes, you can totally justify that as like this is a simulation. Yeah, and this is working like a simulation. Yeah, and that's great, and I can appreciate that. I don't want to play it. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that is a problem with wh- which is yeah. what is a really beautiful game can be soured by a single inappropriate use of output randomness in a game that that shouldn't have it. And bringing up dominant species earlier, I think is a perfect example of that, of just an absolutely beautiful, elegant, incredible, potential 10 rating game that uh, became unplayable to us because of a level of uh, inserted randomness. But it's also like the take that element there too. I, mean, I don't think it's as simple as just like the problem is not with dominant species is not that there's a die roll that screws you. Yeah, it's that there's these big super swingy cards, uh, you know, late in the game that are very. But the, but the randomness is when they come out though, because it, if, if it comes out when it hurts you the most at a random time, whereas a turn later it wouldn't have hurt you at all, then that. So in Coimbra, like. Along these lines, though, like there's plenty of card games where you're going to have variance in the way things come out, and that can benefit one player and not benefit another. But you see, like for example, in Coimbra, they're trying to compress variance for by, for example, splitting up the the citizen deck mm-hmm. into uh, two halves, right? So that they level have level twos a, and level threes. Level twos and level threes. You know, the twos are going to come out in the first half of the game. The threes are going to come out in the second half of the game, and that way he's forcing a more even distribution of of the cards over the course of the game. So you see designers actively trying to mitigate uh, variance in what they uh, do. If you are interested in this topic, if you are a board game designer, um, there's a fantastic uh, lecture that Richard Garfield did. Uh, like Designer six, of Magic the Gathering and most recently Keyforge. Keyforge. I mean, he's... Obviously, one of the most important designers. Yeah, if you're listening, you probably the, know who he yeah, is. Yeah, and let's face it, Magic the Gathering kept this industry alive. Well, we are here for because of Magic the Gathering. Yeah, you know, board games exist because of Magic the Gathering because it it, it it kept all those stores would have closed. Yeah, there'd be no with the, without board Magic game the stores. Gathering. I mean, even today, I don't think there'd be board, many board game stores without Magic selling. But go on YouTube and just you know punch in Richard Garfield Luck in Games. He's got like a 40 minute lecture that he's delivered a oh, number of awesome. times um, that is going to make a lot of this stuff clear. And I guess so. The, the point I would make, um, especially like why we were talking about Coimbra today, is that I just think that output randomness does not belong for the most part in the games that we want to play as part of our board game group as more serious. Euro gamers, I, I just generally think that that's a bad thing. Yeah. And it doesn't belong in whatever form it takes. And it's just that dice are the best example of that in games that we see a lot of times. Absolutely. Let me give a quick review of, of for me on Coimbra. Um, I really do enjoy it. It's a funny thing. Now, I, I really love Lorenzo a Magnifico. Uh, it is probably my favorite middleweight Euro that is not Twop. So that would make it my second favorite middleweight hero. Um, I will always want to play Lorenzo. I'm always down for it to hit the table. I'm always very excited to see it. I love the new expansion, but I, I loved it just as much before the expansion as well. I don't know if I'm I'm as excited to play Coimbra regularly. In fact, we when it first came out, we played it a bunch, and I kind of tired on it pretty quick. I, it felt um, a little less exciting to me than... Uh, Marco Polo or Lorenzo or even Grand Austria. Um, I'd almost rather play any of those than Coimbra. And and it, it, and I think the reason I'm choosing between them is because they fill they, they scratch a very similar itch for me and they take a similar amount of time and they require a similar amount of players. So if we're at a four-player middleweight two-hour game, I'm, I don't know if I'm often going to choose Coimbra over Lorenzo or Marco Polo. Um, I think if given the choice, I, I never would, actually. I think I would always rather play Lorenzo or Marco Polo. Um, 
when it comes to a two hour four player dice placement game. Um, and I was trying to think about why that is. I, th- I think it's, I think, I don't know. I think Coimbra feels, I, th- I think the auction element of Coimbra, uh, feels a little samey to me after round one or round two. I feel like they're, they're, while the dice are different, and you have different choices. I feel like I don't feel like I'm doing much different. Whereas, uh, within Lorenzo, I'm, uh, really excited to see the next age of cards that are coming out. I'm really watching my engine build. I'm racing against other players to make sure that, that, that they're not getting the cards that I get. And then I'm trying to figure out how to, okay, uh, he took that green card that I really needed in order to get my tableau going. How am I going to deal with it? I also have these cards that I'm trying to fulfill in my hand of, you know, appeasing these characters to get these huge, big bonuses. There's just more exciting, uh, decision space for me for me in Coimbra it's okay a little bit of a rinse and repeat feel we've done a round I don't necessarily feel like the next round is going to feel any different to me it's just going to be doing it again and while I like the I like the intrigue of ooh, let me place a die here to make sure I get and reading the card state it feel I don't know for something there isn't an, enough escalation between the rounds to me of watching an engine build the engine building I guess is really it feels more subtle to me it feels like a much smaller dial turn then in Lorenzo, like by the end of Marco Polo or Lorenzo, I feel like I, I really did something. I really built something that's very different from everybody else. And, or, you know, in Marco Polo, I went on a very different journey than everyone else. And I had different problems solving my, you know, issues of uh, resources and camels and things like that. So, yeah, I don't know. To me, the, do you feel, I mean, compared to those games, which I think it's, it's, it's quite apt to compare them because they're, they're all the same designers and they feel similar. Where does Coimbra fall in that, in that line for you? Yeah, I, th- I think I feel completely the opposite really? to you. you know, uh, Coimbra is my favorite of all those games. Coimbra like, uh, is my, I haven't played all the games that you would need to play to say this is the best game of 2018, but yeah. it's the, my favorite game that I played from 2018 that I've that I've played. I mean, you like I've, it more than Teo to Walken? Yeah, amazing. Okay. And I like that game. I would, a lot. I would have guessed you like Teo to Walken more. Nope. Um, and I think maybe part of the thing I like about Coimbra is some of the stuff that you're complaining about, in that I think it it is a little bit lighter. I think it's a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. I think it uh, is a little. It's more elegant. Like, yeah. I really like the way they use this, the dice. Yeah. In the game, and like we didn't even talk about like how you take the die yeah. and you place it in a little die <laughs> well, holder that looks like a little was, castle. Let's talk about the components quickly because the components are beautiful. Now, I mean, the the art is sort of a love hate thing, whether or not you like the art. It's a little cartoony and a little. It feels uh, a little four colory, like it's it, it's very specific on its colors. There's not a lot of gradation between the sort of the four colors they use in it, but um, the components are beautiful the dice, i like the art but <laughs> no and i and i actually do too i yeah. do like the art but the, the 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 dice go into these little castles so they don't roll <clears> around <throat> and you feel like you're slamming and also so people can tell which you know which player is using that die um the insert uh of the box is absolutely beautiful it holds everything perfectly uh i love that <laughs> That's so you guys like yeah, yeah. right you this insert point oh, the insert is gorgeous and it holds everything beautifully it is uh you don't need baggies no but well that's the thing also because you don't need baggies this is not a game you can store on its side a lot of people uh-huh. have side only board mm-hmm. game collections where you're just seeing the spine of the game and it's standing upright uh this is a must be on its back game or else all the pieces are going to spill out uh so to some people that will be a horrible uh insert because you can't take it anywhere because all the pieces are going to shake around but if you just keep your games on your shelf it's going to be so easy to get it out and set it up. And yeah, the pieces are beautiful. It is a gorgeous game. I personally think uh, it is probably the best looking of these games in terms of components and design. Um, I still think Twa to me is the most beautiful game ever made, but I, a lot of people also just don't like that art. Um, but it's yeah, a very distinctive art style that very I think is, is really nice. And I, you know, um, I think we both like this game. I think what you are expressing, if I can project upon you, yeah. is that you are moving as a player. When we started playing games together, you definitely preferred lighter stuff. And this has been a journey for you where you're moving towards heavier and heavier stuff, so much so that you're talking with a great enthusiasm about playing 18xx games. Mm-hmm. And I think you, you know your tastes are gravitating towards heavier stuff so that you're preferring something like Lorenzo over Coimbra. You know, they're similar, but that is definitely the longer, heavier game and that just yeah. maybe maybe what you like now yeah i think i think it might be i mean i i do definitely uh gravitate towards the heavier stuff and also once you add in the expansion to lorenzo it, it adds a whole other level of 
you know, this auction uh, system at the beginning for very asymmetrical starts. Um, but which, it, but it is more like the uh, the expansion like adds more oh yeah. to the game. It literally adds not a whole like, new tower. It's not like it's making it simpler or no, tr- or, no, no. or trimming. It's adding twenty percent to the weight. Whereas I game. feel like Coimbra is the more streamlined game. Like if you were going to sit down at a board game cafe and play with two people that you did not know very well, wouldn't you be much more comfortable putting Coimbra on the table than Lorenzo? Yeah, uh, I think so, especially with, without the expansion. Yeah, uh, and 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 all of them pale in comparison to Trois in terms of weight. I think Trois is the most complicated. Trois is one of those games that I don't care if you are a hardcore Euro gamer, you've played every splatter. It is hard for people to wrap their heads around the way that Trois works. And especially the multiplication you have to do and the division you have to do in terms of your dice pips and how many times they activate different actions and things like that. Um, so yeah, Coimbra, of, if you were looking for a good middleweight Euro to get into you'd be hard pressed to do better than Coimbra. I mean, if you, if, if and you can play it in under two hours, if you're really into Concordia, if you're really into sort I see, I of think the Con- Concordia is like, I think is the good comparison here. Yeah. Like the things I like about Concordia are a lot of the same mm-hmm. things I like about Coimbra. They're where- both perfect level two board games. Like if you, if you're, if you're level one games, if you're playing, you know, uh, Catan or even wingspan, which you recommended last week is a great level one game. If you are ready for level two, Concordia, Coimbra, I mean, you know, some of my favorites that we just mentioned, Lorenzo, Marco Polo, Zolkin's a little heavier, yeah. Tois a little heavier. But, you know, these are these are amazing middleweight Euros. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, Coimbra is a game that you could teach to people who aren't necessarily super into board games and you're not going to scare them off. Um, and it is a fun overall experience. Trey's best game of 2018. Yeah, but I mean... Just so we're clear here, I am not somebody that samples every single game. I'm not an early adapter. Sure. I'm not kickstarting to the degree that you are by a long shot. Right. Uh, well, I, you you are not a collector of board games. We would not. You you you. No, have I buy a, games all the time, but yeah. then I end up giving them to you or giving you them to Tom, right. or they sit on my shelf and just don't get played, and that's sad. Right. Um, but I'm like, I'm going to be at your house. I mean, or your office here. I'm going to be at Tom's. Yeah. So, it, um, you are not a person who who feels the. Uh, the FOMO of a new board game coming out. Oh, I, what if I don't get a copy of this? Well, I, I'm going to, like, if there's a new Lacerda game, yeah. I'm going to play it. True. But otherwise, I'm never just pulling a, a game off the shelf at the game store saying, this looks interesting. Well, unless it's the designer that you love, I feel like you yeah, might. Yeah, if there's a designer I love. But I am, like, I, we have a lot of friends here in the LA community that, like, go to BGG Con, go to Essen. They want to try the new stuff. Like yeah. They want to be the samplers of the of I'm the one new of those, f- for sure. Yeah, you are quickly becoming one of those, and I, I am not. I, yeah. I want to hear somebody say, this is a good game before I spend my time on it. Yep, that's true. So, um, well, Trey is saying this is a good game. <laughs> I think it's a really good game. Uh, these, uh, these Italian designers, uh, their next game is called Terra Mara, supposedly coming out in 2019. That's spelled T-E-R-R-A-M-A-R-A. And this looks very different than every other game they've ever made as it looks almost like some sort of a fantasy game. Um, we don't know very much about Terra Mara right now, but if you look at the box cover, I mean, this does not look like the box cover of someone who made uh, Lorenzo and Grand Austria Hotel. And I mean, it looks it looks maybe like cavemen, dinosaur. I don't know where we're going with it, but it uh, it looks a lot more thematic is what I'm saying than anything else they've made, which um, I'm, I'm down. Hey, man. I'm I'm down for for different themes than you know trading in the Mediterranean when it comes to my middleweight euros. That's right. I mean, well, I mean, board game covers have kind of been notoriously bad, or just like pictures of people. Yeah, and so the, we're seeing it kind pictures of swing of, away of, of men, usually of men in, in silly in a, hats, in silly hats for the, your Mediterranean trading game. Yeah, and this is going, to, but you just can't judge a board game by its cover. It's hey. a cliche. Cliche. 